The Himalayas are formed by the collision between the Indian continent and the rest of Asia. And because that collision is still going on today, the tectonics in the mountains are also active, which makes this an ideal place for relating deep earth processes to what's going on at the Earth's surface. It's an ideal place for investigating the kinematics of continental tectonics and mountain building. Well, the peak in the back there, with its normal cloud cap, is Nanga Parbat, the most western of the 8,000 metre peaks of the Himalayas. And it also includes some of the most rapidly and recently exhumed metamorphic rocks on the planet. Rocks brought up from deep in the earth by mountain uplift and associated erosion. So where are we? Well, we're in the northwest corner of the Himalayas, where the Himalayan mountains converge with the Karakoram. These types of mountain convergences are known as syntaxes. Let's zoom in to the geological map. And syntaxes are commonly marked by these strange loops that you see on geological maps. And the particular loop we're interested in is picked out by the main mantle thrust, a rather dramatic name for the tectonic suture between rocks that originally started as part of the Asian continent, which here are in green, which is the Khorasan Ladakh Island Arc, and the rocks of the Indian continent, which lie to the south. So the main mantle thrust is the suture between the originally two distinct continental bodies. And you can see that it forms a loop around that black triangle. This is the Nanga Parbat syntaxis. And the black triangle is Nanga Parbat itself. Let's go and visit this landscape. So Nanga Parbat with its usual cloud cover, deeply eroded by glaciers. This is the big glacier on its southern side, the Rupal Glacier. And the erosion is deep. So this is one of the largest mountain faces on the planet, the Rupal face, the south face of Nanga Parbat. A face over four kilometres high. And there are other peaks. This is Haramosh, only slightly below 8,000 metres. So dramatically high peaks. But the other part of the landscape here is the Indus Valley, which carves great gorges through these mountains. And it's the Indus that carries the eroded detritus away from the mountains. So in 1988, two geologists from the Open University came to this region to make some films about the geology. Nigel Harris and I were joined by a film crew made up of personnel from the BBC and Pakistan TV. We made a series of films, but the one that this video introduces relates to the building of Nanga Parbat. And the story in the Nanga Parbat film begins here, well south of the Himalayas, and tells the story of a disaster in 1841, where a Sikh army was washed away by a dramatic flash flood that roared down the Indus. The origins of this flood were not local, but up in the high mountains, here on the flanks of Nanga Parbat. It's difficult to get the scale of this picture, but that is the Karakoram Highway, or KKH, a double lane highway that runs up the Indus Valley on its way into the Chinese border. So in 1840 there was an earthquake, and the earthquake triggered a landslide. It was an enormous landslide. This is the extent of the deposit that came down the hillside and blocked the Indus Valley. The valley was blocked for over six months, and a large lake built up for some 40 or 50 kilometres upstream from this blockage. But then it looks like there was another earthquake at the start of June 1841. And it was this release of water that swept away the Sikh army all the way down on the plains. If we just turn around, you can see what it did to the valley downstream from the landslip. 
and just look how carved the sides of the valley are down by the river. Let's just zoom in. You can see that the unconsolidated scree on the sides of the valleys has been carved away, exposing bedrock at a high elevation above the river. Again, you can see the KKH for scale wandering through the rocky outcrops on the left side of the river. And these are the erosion scars left behind after the flood. So the floodwaters came through here and swept on down the Indus Gorge all the way out onto the plains. Well, let's get an idea of the scale. Let's come back to this map and there's the Indus running from the mountains down into the plains. Here is Attuk, where the Sikh army was washed away. And this is where the dam was that failed, and that's where the floodwaters rushed. Notice the scale bar. So floodwaters roared down the Indus for over 300 kilometres, catching the Sikh army completely unawares. They had no idea that the Indus had been blocked upstream. So we want to investigate the geological origins of that flood and the tectonics of the Nangaparvat syntaxis. So we'll zoom into the map area and stay in this box. Here's the map. And let's just summarize the geology in here. Overall, we have a broad antiformal structure, the axis of which is running north, northeast, south, southwest, caught by those pink rocks which are rocks of the Nangaparbat Haramosh Massif, named after the two major peaks in the region. And these comprise Indian continental gneisses, so the part of the Indian continental crust. And this forms the core to this broad antiform. The antiform itself is enveloped by the structurally overlying Kurstan Ladakh island arc terrain. So the MMT, the main mantle thrust, which is the suture, between the Kurstan Ladakh arc terrain and the Indian continent, which is shown by the black line on the map with the little black bricks, well, that suture is also folded around the broad antiform. So we need to think about two aspects of this story. First of all, how do rocks of the Indian continent, the Nangaparbat Haramosh units, how does it end up beneath the Kurstan Ladakh arc? And then secondly, how does this material come to get to the Earth's surface? Two distinct tectonic processes. And the landscape it creates is truly dramatic. So that's a distant view of Nangaparbat looking south. Let's just get an idea of the scale of the relief here. That's Nangaparbat at a shade over 8,000 metres above sea level. And the Indus Valley, only 20 kilometres away from the summit of Nangaparbat, is only a one kilometre above sea level. It's the greatest relief in the continents on Earth. So the first part of our story takes us into the Nangaparbat Massif, in the north there, along the Indus Valley. It's a transect into the main mantle thrust, with a mission to understand the kinematics. Which way did the main mantle thrust move? The transect starts here on the confluence between the Indus and Gilgit rivers and goes into the distance beneath those rather spectacular granite sheets. Let's just step back and look at this on a satellite image from Google Earth. Starting at the yellow dot, we turn right at the confluence there and move up that S-shaped gorge that takes us into the hills. Let's just carve away the satellite image to look at a cross section. So we're starting off in the Kurstan Ladakh arc. There's those granite sheets form a package of units called the confluence granites that start off undeformed, but as we approach the Nangaparbat Haramosh massif, they become sheared and streaked out against the main mantle thrust. So our journey takes us around the back of this hill to the contact in here, the main mantle thrust. Let's zoom in. And there it is in the landscape. Kurstan are the rocks on the left, dipping leftwards, and the steep cliffs beyond the river on the right-hand side of the photograph going up to the snows, well, that is the Nangaparbat Massif, so we're pretty much stood on the contact. If we turn and look sideways now, this is what we see on a cliff section, with the green Kurstan rocks and their granite sheets in red, 
progressively sheared as we come down the hillside to the contact. There are some marbles and other metasediments directly under the contact there, which perhaps represent the sedimentary cover to the old Indian continental crust. And the basement rocks are shown by that sort of orange buff colour at the base, Nanga Parbat, nice. The lower part of the Kohistan rocks, which are amphibolites, are sheared out with a spectacular stretching lineation, which we can use to define the transport axis. And then we can add shear criteria to work out which way these rocks have gone. Overall, then, we're looking at somewhere in a region like this, where the Kurstan arc terrain, the Kurstan Ladakh arc, has been carried onto the Indian continental crust, burying it, taking the cover sediments down into a metamorphic environment and turning them into marbles. But this is a burial process. The Kurstan arc terrain has been carried across the Indian continental crust. And there's a question first, then, to establish which way did they move? What are the kinematics of the main mantle thrust? Well, once we've resolved that, we can begin to ask, how does the Nangaparba Aramush Massif, the Indian continental crust, come back up to the Earth's surface to make the structure that we see today? Let's think about the timing of that. And let's consider a transect in this direction here, West northwest, east southeast, across the massif, and in fact, the transect we're going to show extends beyond the map area. So here we have the transect: west northwest, east southeast, and the extent of the Nangaparbat Haramush Massif in PHM is shown by the black bar there, midway across the transect. And what we're plotting across the transect is age. These are cooling ages. We're going to plot thermochron data, and the data we're going to use comes from fish and tracks. This method determines a cooling age and different minerals close at different temperatures. So therefore, different minerals record different times and temperatures. And we'll build this up gradually. So let's start off with the mineral zircon. And this closes at around 200 degrees centigrade. So fission tracks record the last time the mineral zircon was at 200 degrees centigrade. And there's the data along our transect. So over there on the left-hand end of the profile, the rocks that contain the zircons at outcrop were at 200 degrees centigrade around 15 million years ago. So it's taken 15 million years for that material to cool 200 degrees centigrade. And I infer that that's slow cooling. And it's certainly slow compared to the rocks within the Nangaparbat Haramosh Massif, which were at 200 degrees centigrade only one or two million years ago. So they've cooled much more quickly. Let's just join up the dots. So that's a cooling profile across the massif. Now we can do the same with another mineral, the mineral apatite. And for the sake of our purposes here, we can consider apatite to close at 120 degrees centigrade or so. So the apatite fish and track age records the time when the apatite and the rock that contains it was last at 120 degrees centigrade. And of course, these rocks have cooled from 200 degrees centigrade in the zircon. So the apatite ages are always younger than the zircon ages. The rocks are generally cooling down. So consequently, the apatite ages are younger than the zircons on our plots. Let's just join them all up again. So they're the two profiles, and we can deduce several things from them. In the Nangaparbat Haramush Massif, not only was the cooling very rapid, but it's also recent. It's young cooling. And those profiles are asymmetric. So it looks like the most rapid recent cooling was on the western side. Well, of course, the cooling represents the exhumation of these rocks, the bringing up of the rocks we see at surface through erosion. So we can deduce that rapid cooling means rapid erosion, and young cooling ages represent active exhumation, active erosion. And if we want to look for a tectonic origin for this, then presumably the place to look, according to these data, are on the western side of the Nangaparbat Haramosh Massif. 
So let's go there. Down to here, in an area known as Rykot. We're looking north along the Indus, to the high mountains in the back. The Nangaparbat Massif is on the right-hand side of the river as we look up it. Now, let's look at a cross-section through this part of the massif that runs northwest southeast. And there on the northwest side, we've identified a structure, the Liachar Thrust. And this structure has offset the main mantle thrust shown by the black lines with the brick ornament on it. Let's add some more interpretation. And this fault at outcrop is characterised by broken rocks, cataclasites, and presumably is seismogenic. And it passes down into ductile deformation at depth. So with that sense of kinematics as a thrust, the deep rocks that are deformed in a ductile fashion will be brought up to the Earth's surface, ready for us to do some kinematic analysis. And as a consequence of that thrust movement and erosion happening at the same time, then we'll also bring hot rocks up to the surface, as long as the thrusting rate is faster than the rocks can thermally re-equilibrate. So we infer that isotherms, for example the 300 degrees isotherm, will be very shallow beneath the mountains. And indeed the region is marked by hot springs consistent with this idea of hot rocks near the surface. So what's the kinematics of this deformation? Well, that's something we can go and find out by looking for kinematic indicators. The ductile rocks show these really spectacular stretching lineations, showing us the movement axis. And we can use shear criteria, shear sense indicators, in the NICES to determine the sense of shear that these rocks have seen. Are they showing the thrust senses that we infer from the cross section? The area has spectacular outcrop, and we can use these transects along the ridges of the Langaparbat Nices. And that was the story that the Open University film told. Incidentally, that track running across the cliff section there is a road which is somewhat scary when you think about the construction techniques of dry stone walling on a cliff section like that. So we can conduct a kinematic comparison between the burial of the Nangaparbat rocks beneath Kohistan, beneath the MMT, and then the subsequent exhumation structures associated with bringing the Nangaparbat gneisses back to outcrop again. all within this really dramatic landscape. It's probably the best place in the world for linking deep structure to outcrop and landscape processes.